There's not a person in here that God doesn't love. No matter what condition you're in right now, no matter what kind of day you've had, no matter what kind of week you've had, God loves you. And one proof of that is, look where you're sitting. You're in God's house. I mean, it's not just by accident or chance that you're here. Of all the roads that your life has taken, isn't it amazing that here on this night, this is where you're at. And that's how much God loves you to see to it that you would be here in His house. I want to do something I typically don't do, but I'm going to read the text of my sermon first, and then I'm going to pray. But 2 Kings 5 and 1 says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given him victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Would you point your hands this way and pray? Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your presence right now. I just pray, Lord, that you'll help me now. Pray for your anointing to help me, Lord, to move and operate in the realm of your spirit. That I can simply be your voice and your messenger. A tool and a vessel in your hand to speak this word that you've given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But he was a leper. Naaman is a man who has it all. Through his hard work, his courage, and dedication, we read here in this verse that Naaman has risen to the top. He is the commander of the Syrian army. He has the respect of all around him. He has wealth, as we read into this story, we find out he has wealth, he has power, he has honor. We see that Naaman is a winner. Naaman is a champion of a man. Naaman had made the rank of general to the position of being the number two man in the nation of Syria. Naaman was as great as the world could make him. But with all his prestige, with all his authority and success, Naaman was a doomed man. Because under his uniform, beneath his medals and his armor, was the body of a leper. And you might know some Naamans. People that seemingly have it all together. They have wonderful homes. Wonderful jobs and wonderful families, but there is emptiness inside. Below the surface of their success and achievements, they are in pain. Spiritually, emotionally, they are hurting on the inside. Sin, like leprosy, has created a festering wound that they can do nothing about. They have not been able to answer the question of their own sinfulness, their own leprosy. Naaman's sit in church pews, and outwardly they look like they have it all together, but below the surface, underneath the facade, they need to be healed deep within from unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, and envy. The wounds are many and very deep and have been there a long time. But they have been covered up by an armor of pride. 
They are good people doing good things who are successful and are high achievers, but they're a leper. Like sin, leprosy is incurable, defiling, and it's fatal. And one spot is enough to declare the person utterly unclean. Sin like leprosy penetrates deep and causes a painful wound. In the Old Testament, in the in book of Leviticus, in the Levitical law, chapter 13, verse 3, Leviticus tells us about some of the aspects of leprosy. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair on the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore. Then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. Leprosy also brings separation, and they had to live outside of the camp. Just as leprosy separated the people from going into the tabernacle, so sin also separates us from God. Leviticus 13, 45-46 says, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, and his head bare. And he shall cover his mustache and say and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall be unclean. All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. The leper couldn't come back into the camp. But the priest, as a foreshadowing of Jesus, could come to him. Like the sacrifice to the Lord Jesus, a blood offering would be made by the priest which the leper had to be sprinkled with before he could be pronounced clean. Leviticus 14, 6 and 7, As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them into the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times. Now seven times, you'll hear many times in the Bible, and seven times the number seven is perfection or completion. He shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean. So now after I've read all of that, we can see how serious Naaman's condition is. And that what Naaman needs is a miracle. Naaman would come dangerously close to missing his miracle. Before he could get his miracle, he had to do three things. He had to step, stop, and stoop. Step, stop, and stoop. So tonight, I want to declare to you, don't miss your miracle. And we're going to have to learn how to do the same thing if we're going to have the breakthrough that we need to have. We're going to have to do the same thing if we're going to see the deliverance and the healing and the miracles that we need, not only for ourselves, but also for our loved ones and our friends and family. Amen. We're going to have to learn how to step, stop, and stoop to get where we need to be. So the first thing is, is to step. To step out in faith. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. She lived in Naaman's house. And she was a captive Israelite girl. And she knew that her master, Naaman, had leprosy. And one day when her and the mistress were in the house together, she looked at the mistress and she said with all sincerity, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. We don't find the name of this girl mentioned in the Bible, so I would like to give her a name if it's okay, and I think a good name for her would be Faith. 
Her name is Faith. Amen. We're here. Faith is speaking. Amen. This little Israelite girl who has been taken captive and brought into a, a place that she don't know anything about, a foreign land. And there she is, but her faith has not been diminished. She hears that her master has a deadly disease. Amen. And all of a sudden, faith begins to speak. And she says, oh, I know a man in, she, if in Samaria. And if, she, if he could just get to him, I know that he could can be made well. Somebody needs to hear the voice of faith. This little girl speak tonight. She may have spoken thousands of years ago. It may have been way back in ancient times when this, when this passage of Scripture was recorded. But somebody needs to hear this little girl faith speak tonight. Faith that says, if only you could just get in the presence of God Jehovah. I know that you would be healed and delivered. Amen. I know that you could be cleansed. I know that your life could be changed forever. I know without a doubt if you could just get where God is uh, that you could be set free and you'll never have to walk with that disease anymore. That you'll no longer have to walk, wake up every morning and look in the mirror and wonder how am I ever going to get out of this depression? How am I ever going to get out of this oppression that the enemy has put on my life? But you can be healed without a doubt faith says I know it can happen amen somebody needs to hear the voice of this little girl I know someone who can cure the incurable. I know a man who can. Anybody else here tonight? Anybody else know a man who can heal, set free, deliver, and make whole again? Amen. If only, if only you could get to the place where God's mercy is waiting for you. I know you would have your miracle. What we need to do is we need to cry out like the blind man did when he saw, when he, we didn't see him, but he heard him, amen. He was a blind man. He heard him coming. He knew they were talking about Jesus. And he began to wonder, who is this Jesus? And all of a sudden, he began to cry out loudly. He said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, be quiet. You got to hush. Don't be yelling. But he kept on. He said, oh, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard the plea for mercy, he healed him and opened his blinded eyes. Sometimes instead of praying for a miracle, we just need to pray for his mercy. Sometimes we want God to do this and do that, and we try to give God instructions as to how we want all this to happen and come together. But I believe sometimes the situations are so complicated and we're so distraught and so discouraged, amen, sometimes all we can do is say, Oh, Son of David, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, would you have mercy upon me, amen. I don't know nothing else to pray. I don't know nothing else to say, amen. But sometimes I just got to get down on my knees and I got to say, Lord, have mercy on me. So he stepped out in faith. And Naaman listened to this young Israelite girl. He listened to her faith. And he journeyed towards Samaria to see Elijah the prophet. When he heard that there was somebody that could cure him, when he heard that there was a man of God that could pray for him, a man of God that could come out and speak over him that represented God, Jehovah, he said, you know what, I think I'm going to pack up and I'm going to get all my men together. We're going to get our horses together, our chariots together, and we're going to get our supplies together, and I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to head towards Samaria. Naaman had taken a step of faith towards Samaria to receive his miracle. Amen. Sometimes you got to step out in faith. Amen. It might seem like a long journey. It was about a hundred miles for him. It might seem like it's too far, like it's too difficult. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll just go ahead and step out in faith. Sometimes people look at this altar. They'll be sitting in the back or midways back and they'll look down at this altar and they know this is where they need to be. Amen. The Holy Spirit 
Spirit's moving upon them, uh, ushering them to step out in faith. Uh, but when you're back there, I know it must look like it's a hundred miles away. But praise God, I'm glad to know that it's the greatest step uh, you'll ever take. Amen. If you're going to get your miracle, you got to learn how to step out in faith. Amen. You might say, well, Brother Benny, can I just get it where I'm sitting? Well, I guess Naaman could have thought that. I guess I could just get it here where I'm at, in Syria. But he knew he had to make a move. He knew he had to step out of his comfort zone. He had to get out of the familiar. He had to get out of his little little circle of friends and people. He had to get out of uh, what he knew to be familiar to him as far as religion and doctrine and theology and all of that stuff. Uh, he said, I don't even know about this God, Jehovah, but I'm about to step out, amen. I'm going to step out in faith anyway, and I'm going to move uh, to where I need to be uh, to get my miracle, amen. So we got to stop. He stepped, and now he's got to learn how to stop. That's the thing we're going to have to learn how to do is stop and obey 2 Kings 5 and 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. You see what happened here? We see Naaman has come to the door of Elijah's house. He has come to what I would call the threshold of his healing But this is a critical moment. Not only did Naaman come to this critical moment, but so many people have come to the threshold of their healing. What will Naaman do? Will he let his pride pull him back? Or will he stop, listen, and obey what thus says the word of the Lord? So many people are standing at the door of the miracle. And they've been there a long time. Some have been there 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But they've never received their healing and deliverance because they have let doubt and they have let pride pull them back. Amen. But if they would only obey, there is a miracle at the Jordan. If they would just go ahead and obey, Amen. The mistake that Naaman makes is that he already has it in his mind how he wants this miracle to come about, but God has something totally different in mind. And that's where we all make our mistake. We have it in our mind how we want this to be done. And we sit on a pew Sunday after Sunday, never budging, never moving, never stepping out in faith, never obeying, and we just want things done our way, on our terms, on our time, never willing to step into the supernatural. Sometimes you gotta step out of your flesh, amen. You gotta step out of the natural to be able to get into the supernatural. You say, well, why is it that way? Well, I don't know. That's just the way God operates. We see it all through the passage of Scripture. Naaman has all his chariots and horses lined up. He has his nice uh, military decorations on, his uniform. It is a stately display. I can only imagine on a grand scale. It's somewhat like a parade that shows up in front of Elijah's house. A foreign delegation of ambassadors, military people at the door of Elijah's house. Naaman has even brought expensive gifts to pay Elisha for his cure. Naaman is expecting some grand ceremony as he knocks on the door, expecting the man of God, Elisha, to appear. 
But Elisha never comes out. Elisha stays in the house. Elisha sends his servant, his servant, out to Naaman. And the message that he sends to Naaman through his servant, the servant, I, I don't know what all he said, the scripture did, but I can just see this servant walking out there. He says, uh, excuse me, sir, um, I'm here to tell you what the man of God is wanting you to do. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Turns around, walks back in the house, closes the door. What? What? Is this some kind of joke? In fact, it goes on to say in verse 11, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He'll surely come out to me and he'll call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and there's going to be some great ceremony just like I was thinking and heal my leprosy. Then he goes on to say, and are not the Abna and the and the far part of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not have just stayed home and washed in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a rage. Naaman was so close to salvation, yet so far away. You have to come to the place that God has appointed. You have to come to your spiritual Jordan. The place where God is waiting for you to come that He may come to you. Naaman thought to himself, there must be a better way to do this. There must be better, cleaner rivers than this old muddy Jordan River. Are not the rivers of my homeland far better than all of the waters of Israel. You see, Naaman might wash in the cleaner waters of the other rivers and be clean from dirt, but he would not be clean of the leprosy. Jordan was the appointed place. If Naaman is to expect a cure from the divine power... He must comply. Hear me, church. Somebody needs to listen to me. If he was to expect a cure from the divine power, he must comply and submit to the divine will without asking why or wherefore and what for. Naaman was thinking there has to be a more dignified way to do this. Come on, somebody help me out. There has to be a little more dignified way to go about this church stuff nowadays. You know, we have become more sophisticated and we have become more intelligent, more educated, so there's got to be a more dignified way to do church nowadays. Oh, that was our, our grandmothers and our grandfathers and that was old-fashioned and it was good for them. So, you know, there's got to be a more dignified way to get where you need to be. There's got to be a more dignified way to get the cure that I need. A lot of the ways God chose to work in people's lives throughout Scripture required them to get undignified. Oh, I'm preaching now. I'm telling you, you read the Bible and you see where God showed up in some amazing and miraculous ways. It caused people to lay down their pride and to lay down their dignity and say, God, I don't care what you got to do. Hallelujah. I say just do whatever it takes. Hallelujah. I don't care if I look like a fool. I don't care if people think I'm an idiot. I don't care if it embarrasses my next door neighbor. I don't care if it embarrasses the person next to me. Hallelujah. I need help. I need a miracle and I need mercy. Whatever it takes. Hallelujah. That's what I'm willing to do to the flesh it might seem foolish and it usually always does can I get an amen 
It might seem unseemly. It might seem out of place. It might seem out of character. But God has to get our dignified flesh out of the way before He can perform the miracle that we need. If we expect a cure, we must comply and submit to the will of God and obey what thus says the Word of the Lord. Whether we like it, understand it, agree with it, we must obey what God asks us to do. Amen. Naaman had a choice. Obey or remain a leper. I want to ask the same question tonight. Are you going to obey or are you going to remain a leper? It's your choice. I believe there's people in the sound of my voice many times that you've sat and you knew you needed to step out, but you chose not to. And you, are, you have chosen to remain to be a leper. Second Kings 5.13, and his servants came near and spoke to him. You know, he's mad. I mean, Naaman is mad. He's packing everything up. He says, guys, we're going back home. But his servants have enough discernment and enough reason about them to say, well, wait a minute, stop. Stop, Naaman. Stop just for a second. Stop. Think about what you're doing. And they said, if the prophet, in verse 13, if the prophet had told you to do something great, something dignified, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Yeah, it's, we understand name and it is a little undignified. It really doesn't make sense to go down into a muddy, dirty river. But what do you got to lose? Hallelujah. Somebody, what do you got to lose? But they were telling you, what do you got to lose? You can sit there like you are in the condition you're in. Or you can step out and obey. And plus, what do you got to lose at the end of the day? And what Naaman had to lose was leprosy. They pled with him, stop and obey and do what the prophet of God says. The last thing he has to do is he has to stoop in humility. Stoop in humility. The simple act of washing in the Jordan River was beneath Naaman. And he even had felt insulted by such an ideal. So what we see here, now listen, to zero in what I'm fixing to say. So what we see here, the real underlying issue for Naaman was the disease of pride. Pride. That was more serious than his leprosy. Was his pride. His pride was about to keep him from getting his miracle. His pride was about to cause him to miss his miracle. And a lot of people miss out on their miracle because of unresolved issues. It's startling to to think that Naaman may have missed his miracle because of, of one unresolved issue, and it was his pride. Could it be there is an unresolved issue in your life tonight that's causing you to miss out on your miracle? Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's bitterness. A, a habit. A bad attitude. Something. Something. An unresolved issue that is keeping you from your miracle. Before Naaman could be cured, the issue of his pride had to be dealt with. Before there could be a healing, there had to be a humbling. 
I want to ask you some questions tonight. If God told you to come down here and kneel in the altar, would you do it? If God told you to walk through a prayer line, would you do it? If God told you to walk around the sanctuary, praising and worshiping and lifting your hands unto Him, would you do it? If God told you to go make some things right with someone that you have unforgiveness built up against, would you do it? If God told you to lay down that habit, would you do it? You see, God is willing, but your unwillingness is the problem. If you can't do what you know God is asking you to do, you need to be healed of your pride first. Amen. You got to get the issue resolved with your pride. Amen. Pride will stifle your worship. Amen. Pride will stifle the freedom that God wants to give you. Pride will stifle the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Pride will stifle the life and passion and energy of God's people more than anything else. Pride. More people have clenched the back of pews and white knuckled backs of pews all because of pride. They could not go of the pew because they could not let go of the pride in their life. Naaman had to deal with this pride. Because James 4 and 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. His grace can't come to you if you're filled with pride. You've got to turn loose of that pride so that He can give His grace to you. James 4 and 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Amen. There's some people that need to be lifted up out of some situations you're going through, but you're going to have to first humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Amen. So that He can begin to do the work that you need Him to do. Amen. Second Kings 5.14 So name and listen to His servants. He's covered in leprosy. And he finally comes to the conclusion, I've got to let go and let God take over. What do I got to lose? So he went down. I love that part, so he went down. You're going to have to, we're going to have to learn how to go down. We're going to have to learn how, he had to get off his high horse, and he had to get down, off of it, and get down and go into the Jordan. This man had a power, he had authority, he had, he had a place of elevation, he was always looked upon and honored, but here comes a man who's been humbled, amen. A man who is broken, a man who is covered in leprosy. He gets off his horse and begins to walk down along the muddy banks of the Jordan. His feet touch that cold water and he just keeps walking. He says, I've got nothing to lose, amen. I've got to get a miracle, amen. I've got to stoop, I've got to humble myself if I'm going to get the miracle that God has waiting on me. You gotta stoop and humble yourself to receive the miracle that's waiting on you tonight. You've been waiting a long time. Some of you have been waiting for years. And God just wants me to tell you, you've been wondering why it hasn't happened. He asked, Where are you at? Where are you sitting? Have you moved out? Have you stopped? Have you stepped? Have you stopped? Have you stooped? So he went down and dipped seven times. There's that seven times again. We've, we've, we've read that several times. Seven times. Perfection, completion. He dipped seven times in that old muddy Jordan. According to what? According to the saying of the man of God. 
and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Naaman had to go down into the water seven times. And sometimes we may have to go down more than once. Has anybody else had to come to the altar more than once over the same thing? Some of you are saying, well, I've been down two, three, four times, Brother Benny. And it's not changed, it seems. Some of you have only been down once and you just gave up on the first try. But old Naaman, he had to keep at it. One. Go down again. Two. Three. Again and again and again and again. He kept going down. You sometimes you're going to have to keep coming down again and again and again. Amen. You may have to keep coming through prayer line after prayer line. You may have to keep coming to the altar Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Amen. That's okay. Don't you worry about what everybody else says. Uh, you're being humble. You're stupid uh, because you know uh, that you need help from the Lord. Amen. Uh, don't worry about the grandstanders. Uh, don't worry about whether well, they go again to the altar. They go every time. Well, praise God. Excuse me, ma'am or sir, but with that attitude, uh, you might want to get down here too. Amen. Praise God. It, it, it concerns me when I never see or some. I, I'm just preaching. I'm your pastor. I love you. Amen. God sent me by here to pastor this church uh, and lead this church. Amen. Uh, and I'm trying to get people to come alongside the still waters uh, and to lay down uh, in the green pastures. Uh, but it concerns this preacher. But I've been preaching for three years uh, and there's people sitting in this church uh, that never have darkened uh, an altar. Come on. Hallelujah. Somebody help me out. I'm preaching here now. I'm digging deep. I know I'm stirring up devils and demons and I know Monday's coming. That's all right, amen. But I'm going to do exactly what God called me to do, amen. Hallelujah. If you're wanting to come to a church and go through a ritual and a program where you feel comfortable and you can come in here and not be challenged, you're in the wrong place. I'm going to challenge us every time we come. I'm going to challenge us, amen, to take a step closer to God Almighty. I'm going to challenge us to step off in the Jordan, amen. I'm going to challenge us to experience, oh, hallelujah, the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hallelujah. So you gotta, you gotta step, you gotta stop, and you gotta stoop. Well, so he goes down and he comes up clean. He goes down and he comes up clean. Now I don't know, I wasn't there, but I've got an imagination. I just. You know, thinking, now nah, I, 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 got no, I got no text, I got no scripture for this, I got no commentary for it. But I just wonder, when old Naaman come up out of that water, and he's saying he was clean. Woo, hallelujah. Praise God. And he walked up on the bank and there sat all of his entourage, all his people. And I just wonder maybe if one of those servants that had stopped him and said, hey, what do you got to lose? I just wonder maybe if that servant might have looked at him and said, now, now there, doesn't that feel better? That wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, was it, Naaman? Oh, you'd feel so much better if you would just step, stop and stoop he said that servant might have said you know you were miserable Naaman you were being tormented by the leprosy you just kept resisting what the spirit of the Lord was leading you to do now aren't you glad oh hallelujah aren't you glad Naaman you obeyed and humbled yourself and got in that river what a relief oh what a relief 
What a relief it was to finally obey and humble himself. Amen. And I want to tell somebody here today, oh, what a relief it'll be. Amen. It'll be a relief to your soul, to your emotions. Amen. A relief to you spiritually if you just step out and obey the Lord. Amen. What a relief. I don't know why it's got to be this way. I know God can do miracles right where we sit. I know God can, can heal us in our home. He can perform miracles on the job. I know it's not confined to one location. But I can tell you from Scripture, biblical proof, biblical text, that God most often requires man to do something that he's not comfortable doing and that doesn't make any sense at all in the natural Oh, I like this. I'm almost done. 2 Kings 5 and 15. So they got their stuff together. And he headed back. He wanted to go back to Elijah's house. And he returned to the man of God. And he and all his aides. And came and stood before him and said, Indeed. Oh, hallelujah. Now I know. Oh, hallelujah. Now, indeed, I know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. Now, I know that He is the one true God, that He is God Jehovah. Amen. Now, I know what y'all been talking about over here. Now, I know why we've been hearing about all these reports of miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, I know why there's favor upon you. Now, I know why you're always winning the battles and getting the victory. Now, I know, for I have experienced the power of God for myself. Hallelujah. Now I know. I didn't know. But now I know. And I've heard people say, why didn't y'all tell me it was this good? Why didn't y'all tell me it was going to be like this? Amen. I, I've never felt anything like this in my life. I, I've never known uh, anything uh, like this before. I've never had an experience like this before. Oh, but hallelujah. Now I know. Amen. Does anybody know how powerful God is? Amen. Now I know, he said. I know that there is a God in Israel. You know, the thing that, that I thought was so amazing. Music, would you go ahead and come back? I think it was so amazing that he got to talking to Elijah there. He said, you know what? He said, if you don't mind, I'd like to take two mule loads of this dirt home. And I'm going to build an altar. And I'm not going to worship them other gods anymore, but I'm going to worship the one true God. Isn't it amazing? The man who didn't want to get in a muddy river now wants to take the dirt home with him. He wants to take part of the experience. He said, I'm going to take this home with me. I'm going to tell you, this is something you can take home with you, amen. You don't have to just come to church and experience this, but you can take this to the house, amen. You can take this to the job, amen. You can load it up and spread it all around and say, I know that there is a God, amen. Would you stand, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I figured y'all know what I was getting ready to do. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pull this one over here a little bit. This, just, just like that right there. I got it. Thank y'all. I know. We got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Now, as always, I need prayer warriors. I need people who believe in what I'm saying. I need some prayer warriors. Would you come and line up here and help me pray? I know that I call upon y'all quite often, but praise God. God's going to do a work here. God's going to help us. Hallelujah. God's going to show Himself strong here tonight. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, church, begin to pray. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. God, I pray now for your anointing right through here. Hallelujah. In the name, oh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I, I pray for your anointing. Hallelujah. To begin to flow through this area right here, Lord. Let this be ground zero. Let this be the appointed place. Let this be somebody's Jordan that they step into here tonight and get the miracle that they need. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I really need one more. I need a couple more people. I don't have a complete line here. I need a couple more people to help us pray right here on the end. Hallelujah. I got to get this prayer line set up just right. We got to get this thing set up. I can't press on. Come on in. Come on in. Hallelujah. If you believe and if your faith can be used, hallelujah, you come on. You ain't got to be a member here. But if you hear what I'm saying and it resonates in your heart, come on down. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I know it sounds crazy what I'm doing, but I feel like I need to do it again. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Pray, let the praises go up. Come on, church. Come on, all over the building. Just begin to praise Him. I would ask that everybody would lift your hand and just begin to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's okay. Hallelujah. We all got to be together on this. Hallelujah. We need unity in the body. We all got to be desiring for the same thing. All together in one mind, in one accord, in one place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, All right if you're ready to step out. If you're ready to step out, stop and obey and stoop. It's a good time to come. Hallelujah. Exercise your faith. Hallelujah. Exercise. Come on. Prayer line's open. Prayer line's open. Come on, church. Go ahead, Brother Dustin. Lead us. Oh.